From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. And it is my pleasure to welcome you back to the Cannabis Podcast. Thanks for coming back. Maybe this is your very first visit. If it is, well, an especially warm welcome for you. Over the next 30 or 40 minutes, we are going to be talking about a plant that I absolutely have a passion for, and that is cannabis. Perhaps you have that same passion. Before we get too far along, let me remind you this program is intended only for those 19 or older in your jurisdiction, and is intended primarily for educational and entertainment purposes. You should always consume your cannabis responsibly. In episode 140, we talk with Alexandre Poulon. He's the CEO of Jubilee, which is an edible manufacturer in Quebec, and Alexandre gives us a peek into the Quebec cannabis market. We cover off Medical Cannabis 101 for those seeking some relief through cannabis. On Cultivar Corner, we're heading 45 minutes down the highway to Summerland and the home of J-Buds. We are tasting J-Buds Dream Catcher. And we're going to end the episode with some humor about a true cannabis moment. All of that and more on episode 140 of the Cannabis Podcast. And let me thank you for being a listener of the Cannabis Podcast. I truly appreciate the fact that you're here. I also appreciate the support I get from my supporters. Let me welcome Jordan. Jordan is another BC resident. Jordan's from Kimberley, and he just joined through buymeacoffee.com slash cannabis podcast, along with Kevin and Jordana. Thank you for joining, Jordan. I hope you enjoy the ride. I also want to thank my patrons at Patreon, Tony, Roger, Gage, and Rob. Truly appreciate your support, and thanks especially to Rob. Rob sent me a couple of doobies in recognition of my brother Bill after last week's episode. Truly appreciate that, Rob. Thank you so much. And now let's get started with our first story of the day, and for this we're going to Kenigma.com, and this is Medical Cannabis 101. For decades, marijuana has been known as an illegal drug and a subculture of its own far from the mainstream. In recent years, though, scientists have found more and more evidence of its therapeutic potential. Cannabis has become a trusted daily medication for millions of people across the world, treating conditions ranging from anxiety to arthritis to the nausea caused by chemotherapy, without the dangerous and harmful side effects of many popular pharmaceuticals. In the early 1990s, researchers discovered a previously unknown communication system involved in the regulation of nearly every essential function in the body. They named it the endocannabinoid system, or ECS, after the plant elements that led researchers to its discovery, cannabinoids. The system is made up of cannabinoid receptors, called CB1 and CB2. Endocannabinoids, natural chemicals in the human body which activate or modulate CB1 and CB2 activity, and enzymes which metabolize the endocannabinoids and clear them from the body. The ECS modulates many of the body's most important functions, including sleep, hunger, pain, anxiety, nausea, and energy metabolism, among others. In fact, the endocannabinoid system is so vital to maintaining homeostasis, a state of balance in the body, that some researchers believe many health conditions can be explained by endocannabinoid deficiencies. These conditions include migraines, irritable bowel syndrome, and fibromyalgia, among others. There are more than 500 different chemicals in cannabis, including at least 140 which are known as cannabinoids, compounds unique to marijuana alone. The two most prominent cannabinoids are tetrahydrocannabinol, THC, which provides cannabis with much of its psychotropic and medicinal effects, and cannabidiol, CBD, which is touted for having medicinal benefits without the same intoxicating high of THC. Terpenes are compounds that produce the aroma and taste of cannabis, and the reason one strain of marijuana tastes like lemon while another gives off a piney aroma. Scientists also believe that the varying sedating, uplifting, and other distinguishing effects of cannabis strains are a result of their terpenoid profile, and the terpenes play a role in the medical therapeutic effects of cannabis. The terpene levels are often presented on the packaging of medical marijuana products next to the THC-CBD ratios and sativa indica origins of the strain. With most medications, dosing is pretty simple. There are clinical trials, FDA approval, and recommendations handed down to doctors and pharmacists based on specific chemical calculations. For cannabis, dosing is not yet an exact science, and a much more individualized approach is required. A doctor prescribing cannabis must consider the best delivery methods for their patient as well as the right CBD to THC ratio, terpenes, or which strain of marijuana is best for the patient. In addition to how one takes cannabis, the type of cannabis is also very important. Cannabis strains are often divided mainly into two botanical distinctions, sativa or indica, or hybrids, which are a mix of the two. Sativa strains are also said to provide a more energetic cerebral sensation. Indica strains are said to be more relaxing, the type that you'd want to use at night, 
Many cannabis patients use this distinction in order to decide which strain to use and when to use it. Cannabis delivery methods mainly fall into one of three categories. Inhalation, ingestion, or topical, dermal application. Each has its own pros and cons. Inhalation is the most popular delivery method, largely because it's convenient, simple, fast-acting, and enjoyable. When cannabis is inhaled, it directly enters the lungs en route to being absorbed into the bloodstream, creating almost instantaneous onset. There's also the fact that smoking in and of itself, be it with a pipe, bong, or marijuana cigarette, or a joint, can be a therapeutic, enjoyable exercise. One major downside of smoking is that it can be harmful to the lungs and throat. For this reason, it is advisable for people with pulmonary conditions to avoid smoking. Smoking also produces a strong aroma in secondhand smoke, and it is not the most discreet way to consume cannabis. That's where vaporization comes in. Vaporizing cannabis has exploded in popularity in recent years, largely because it is much more discreet than smoking, but also because it heats up the flower just enough to release an inhalable vapor without the harmful effects of igniting organic plant material. When taken orally, cannabis is absorbed through the gastrointestinal tract or sublingually underneath the tongue. It can take as much as an hour and a half for patients to feel the effects of edibles to kick in, and they can have a long-lasting, potent effect without the harmful effects of smoking. Sublingual administration has a quicker onset, more akin to smoking or vaporizing. In addition to edible THC and CBD cookies, brownies, infused drinks, and gummies, ingestibles can also be taken in the form of oils, tinctures, pills, capsules, powders, and tablets. Topical applications involve balms, solves, and creams which are made with a cannabis extract concentrate mixed with a base like beeswax, shea butter, or coconut oil. For people with intense pain, dermal applications may not be strong enough. These patients may prefer applying cannabis by way of a transdermal patch, which permeates the skin and is absorbed through the bloodstream, producing a systematic effect rather than a local effect. Though cannabis is a very safe form of medication, everything you put in your body has side effects, both positive and negative. THC can cause short-term memory loss, an inability to focus, slowed reflexes, as well as feelings of paranoia and anxiety at times. It's also known for causing a dry mouth, red eyes, and an increased appetite, the so-called munchies. While for some users, side effects like the munchies can be desirable, for others this may not be the case. Regardless, there are all side effects that wear off quickly once the high is over, though they can still be unpleasant or unwelcome at times. In addition, smoking cannabis can result in many of the same respiratory side effects that are caused by any form of smoking. People with respiratory conditions, such as COPD, should consider other delivery methods. In addition to side effects, cannabis can have interactions with a wide range of medications, from calcium channel blockers to blood thinners to selective serotonin uptake inhibitors and antidepressants. It can also intensify the effects of depressants like alcohol, barbiturates, and opioids, among others. Patients who are also on a prescribed medication routine should consult with their physician before starting medical cannabis in order to avoid any adverse drug reactions. For new patients, discovering the world of medical or recreational cannabis can be a bewildering experience at times. That's partly due to the fact that cannabis is such a complex plant, and the culture and industry surrounding medical and recreational marijuana is so vast. Like with dosing, it's advisable to start low and slow. And to remember there is an ever-expanding base of research behind the science of cannabis. Further, countless patients and fellow travelers who have been in your shoes before and can provide advice and a helping hand. And if you're considering finding some relief from cannabis, I hope that gives you some ideas of what you can look for. From the Cannabis Infused Studio in the Clouds, this is the Cannabis Podcast. So let me introduce you today to Alexandre Poulon. He is the Chief Innovation Officer of Jubilee. Jubilee is a Quebec-based cannabis company that recently launched a range of superfood edibles in Canada. That's one of the things we're going to be talking about. He is also the president of the Quebec Council of Edible Cannabis. We'll be chatting a little bit about that too. Alexandre, welcome to the Cannabis Podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Gary. It's a pleasure to be here today. So what I always like to start with, Alexandre, is what's your cannabis story? Where did your journey with cannabis begin? Actually, I'm what we call a legacy, a legacy worker. So I've been working with the plants since the last 15 years commercially, and but I've been a consumer from, from, for the plants since my early teenage years. I've, I've been a person living with very uh, strong ADHD. I was a very awkward little man when I was a kid, and uh, cannabis helped me being myself, helped me uh, focus, helped me being a better student, and then uh, it always followed me. I hustled cannabis most of my life, and my commercial cannabis uh, life started as a formulator, as a product formulator. So I started to work to develop various cannabis metrics as food and topicals as well uh, in the old ACMPR landscape as well, where where, where I helped develop various products for uh, endometriosis, uh, arthritis, arthrosis as well, uh, with always a medical side of it in the formulation. But as a consumer, uh, I consume recreationally as much as I consume medicinally, I would say. 
so that allowed me to uh, collaborate in these various projects. And as an anthropologist, I got to travel the world and to study various um, cannabis producing region where I, I, I got the chance to study the interaction within the plant consumption and some religious behavior as well. Uh, so it got me to, um, to get these very deep traditional knowledge uh, in North Africa, in Oaxaca, Mexico, in the Philippines, Indonesia as well, which is uh, the background of my, I'd say my cannabis story. It goes it goes wider than this, but that'd be that that'd be the, the the beginning of it. I'd say I'm uh, very passionate about this, the way it helped me, the way it helped people around me, and my mission is to bring forward this wellness uh, as far as I can, you know. And I can hear the passion in your voice for the subjects, much much like the many of the people that we have as guests on this on the show. So I appreciate that, Alexandra. One of the things I want to start with actually is you mentioned your reference with some uh, some cutting edge cannabis environments that you've had some experience with. I'm intrigued, uh, Alexandra, with what you already mentioned the fact that you have been in a number of different cannabis environments as you began your journey. Give us a sense of what some of those early environments were and, and some of the knowledge you got out of that. Fantastic. So I will try. I will uh, start with the traditional experience. As I said, in Morocco, personally, I've got this this wonderful experience when I began to travel there in the Ashish producing region called the Reef in Ketama, the particular region. So I would say, like this 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 first kind of project. Uh, cannabis project of learning how to make this traditional dry sift ashish, how to press it, how to age it, and why various methods were used for various purposes. I would say this is was one of the first project that I was um, that I found that I understood the real diversity of cannabis usage because there was like this ashish that was laying on the on the rooftop where I was sleeping, and people you know were laying the ashish there. So I was asking why is that they say it's the ashish for the people the old people this they take before they go to sleep not to wake up at night f to, for urinating so I, I didn't know cbn back then but that was the first time i've seen like this differentiated use of cannabis i didn't even know cannabinoids back then you know like with cannabis yeah. the weed you know it was it was the plant you know it was a young hippie on the road you know i was doing my <laughs> thing i had long hair long beard as well wonderful wonderful you know like times of my life and and then i learned that this, this that, that differentiation in the use of cannabis let's fast forward 10 years you know 10 years forward than this then we start to have these studies on degradation of cannabinoids you know and all how this thc converts into cbn which provide the sedation effect you know and when i learned, when i read that i had this like ah moment you know like ah oh, that's what they've been doing on, on these on these rooftops you know like this traditional knowledge that was in so intricate and so precise in the use they would make you know they would make this majun which is this this edible this traditional edible uh, and they would use some of this ashish in this majun and this is the majun you don't take during the day because you won't work if you work and you have back back ache you take this majun and you, oh, you, you you smoke this keef you know so this this was very amazing and then Fast forward, like I said, 10 years after that, these, these cutting edge projects that I'm leading right now are very much into how to utilize these molecules, you know, that, that were used for thousands of years ago. But nowadays we've got modern science and modern food science that can actually provide these explanations. So uh, another project I would say was the creation of these Jubilee fruit bites, you know, where we wanted to create specific effect in each and every product we pushed forward. And even without the cannabinoids in them, you know, let's say the... Um, the apple and matcha variety that we've created you know we wanted to push forward an energizing effect a sativa spectrum kind of effect so we we pushed the uh we we used the matcha tea the organic matcha tea as you know like a natural uh intake of caffeine so the, the product itself even without the cannabinoids provide this energetic effect you know there's even ginger and cinnamon in there to provide this effect and then we use cannabinoids to exacerbate to 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 enhance the effect that actually is within the product itself. So I'd say like this is, this is the next frontier of cannabis research in edible. That was what was intrigued me when uh, folks first uh, approached me about having you on the show and uh, gave me a bit of background about Jubilee and what you're doing not only with the various cannabinoids that you kind of already mentioned, but adding those other ingredients or, or what you're referring to as superfoods to make them a, a truly unique edible. Let's, let's talk a little bit more about that, Alexandra. So give me a sense of where the idea for Jubilee came from and, and, and what you've done to this point. Fantastic. It's, it's all intertwined. As I said, I traveled a lot for cannabis purposes. So when I was in North Africa, I ate these traditional edibles, you know. And if you were to travel a thousand years ago in Northern Africa, you would eat an edible there. It would likely be similar in texture and look as what we offer in Jubilee. So Jubilee is an inspiration deeply rooted in cannabis tradition, thousands of years old. We wanted to pay homage to these 
to these traditions, you know, that, that, that put cannabis on a pedestal, that put cannabis as an ingredient, as a functional ingredient, as a superfood itself, you know, and it was always like this, you know, gummies and chocolate, as much as good as they are, they are a result of prohibition, you know, cannabis was itself much more complicated, much more deep before the prohibition arrived and removed most, much of this complexity in, in the world. So the idea from Jubilee came from this traditional knowledge and the modern food science that we have access today. So I wanted to be able to tap into this modern food science for effect, so it's for, for ingredients that have effect on the human body, let's say digestion, let's say sleeping aid, let's say energy, energy like I said with the matcha, you know, we wanted to tap in this and then to use the cannabinoid, the cannabinoids as ingredients, you know, to enhance the effect that were in there. So let's say we have this uh, Jubilee uh, blueberry fruit bites, we wanted to create a, a blueberry and lavender fruit bite that would be sedative. So we used hand-picked wild Quebec blueberries from northern, northern Quebec and we use the lavender from 45 minutes from our facility, you know, that we grind ourselves, you know, we work it cold in minus 20 environment to keep all the volatiles from the lavender, all the smell from the lavender is still in there. And this smell is flavor and this flavor is our molecule and these molecules affect your central nervous system. Linalol, karyophyllin, you know, they are proven molecules that provide, you know, calming effect. Even, you know, linalol in big quantity can be can be psychoactive as well, you know. And then when we use this linalol from the very raw lavender that we grind ourselves, and I, I still use my, you know, my, my sift and I sift it by hand, you know, it's very, very traditional way we use it uh, in our facility. We do very small, very small facility as well. But um, to get back to the formulation itself, we, the, the, the inspiration came from old world edibles. Then we use the modern food science to explain the various ingredients that we use, each and every ingredient has a purpose. We don't even have we don't even have any uh, preservative whatsoever, and no 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 chemicals whatsoever in the product because you know the inherent power of nature, of dried fruit and flowers and spices, they all have preservative agents in them naturally. And cannabis itself is is natural is as in natural preservative agents as well. So yes, we deeply rooted in traditional knowledges with the modern food science approach, and we wanted to provide this uh, this. Uh, no sugar added, vegan, gluten free, no allergen edible. So regardless of the medical background of the consumer, most people can eat Jubilee edibles. I wanted to create an accessible and democratic, uh, democratic edible. That was the purpose of it. In terms of availability of the Jubilee product, where is that available now? And I, and I say that because I have not yet seen any in BC. I know we're not yet in BC. We wish that uh, we maybe we'll be in BC in 2020, 2024. Fingers crossed that uh, we will get a good welcome over there. Uh, uh, we are in Ontario. Uh, we've got two varieties in Ontario, the apple and matcha and the cherry and cocoa. We're in the number one edible selling brand in my own province of Quebec. I say it with a lot of pride because in Quebec it was very hard to push the edible market here. I bet. And we, we, yeah. we managed to do it through the uh, Edible Council of Quebec, uh, the Quebec Council of Edible Cannabis, apologies. And uh, so we can find us in Quebec, in Newfoundland, in Ontario. We're in the Northern Territory, Northwestern territory, Yukon, Nunavut, and uh, I wish that at the end of 2024, most Canadians will be able to, to eat our uh, lovely fruit bites and to, you know, get all these benefits from our local fruits and local cannabis as well. It'd be really exciting for us to be able to access your product here, so I look forward to when the arrival of it, and I, and I know you'll get here eventually. So you, you also mentioned, Alexandre, the Quebec Council of Edible Cannabis which uh, you are, you're currently the president of that body? Yes, exactly. It's, uh, we're a small council. We know uh, since it's a very small industry in Quebec, yeah, we're not a lot of people, but we, uh, we wanted to be able to push uh, forward the um, education and then the, uh, the legislation itself. So what kind of work are you as an organization doing to support the introduction and, and I guess the expansion of edibles in Quebec? The, the, the heaviest part of the, of the work was done, uh, I'd say, a, a couple of years ago when the, uh, the edible cannabis arrived in Canada. We decided to legalize it in the second phase of the legalization of the recreational cannabis and Quebec decided to say no. Uh, for me, uh, edible cannabis was always dear to my hearts, and when, when it, it happened, I said, no, it's not going to be a no. No, it, it won't be a no. It's, it cannot be a no. No, P People from Quebec uh, it must have access to alternative than rolling a joint. You know, I love joints myself, you know, like I love smoking joints, but, you know, like uh, I've, I love to have alternative to my consumption, and I really wanted the Quebec consumer, so I really felt, as an activist myself all my life, I, will, I was in all these manifestations, on all these these uh, these, uh, these various, um, you know, um, initiatives that we wanted to push forward cannabis, and, and as an activist, when I've seen that, fire caught in my heart, you know, I wanted to push 
and I, I, I was I, I wasn't pleased, you know, wasn't pleased. I, I'd say it's a it's a euphemism saying I wasn't pleased. And <laughs> so uh, we decided to roll our sleeves and to fight it, you know, and we fought it. And we, we, we um, I was at, at the beginning I wasn't the president. I was the scientific uh, scientific uh, council on the on the board itself. And then at some point the the president uh, left the cannabis industry and I took the I took the hat. And when I took the hat, I decided to be very aggressive, uh, very aggressive with the SQDC, but you know as as a partner, an aggressive partner. And I decided to just say like, okay, it's going to come at some point, you know. I just want to know when it's going to come, when it's going to come, what what is it going to be? And they didn't know, you know. And so we co-defined it. We did all these meetings with the SQDC, with various, uh, you know, uh, uh, ruling parties and and um, and stakeholders, you know. And we wanted to force the definition on what's going to be the what they call the the the, the, uh, the sandbox of cannabis, of edible cannabis in Quebec. So I sent. They said like, yeah, propose stuff, you know. So I sent them a total of 28 various recipes to the director's home. <laughs> uh, to their home, you know, like di- directly to their home, various recipes, you know, like uh, granola bars with charcoal in it because they didn't want it to be uh, attractive for kids under 21 years old, but which is a very arbitrary kind of saying, you know, which what's what's attractive to who it's a, it's a big thing. 20, 20, 21 years old people are adult, adults then. So, yeah, so I just decided to all in. I started our R&D process that never stopped, actually. It never stopped. It never will stop. I'm, I'm still one of the most annoying person in Quebec for this. I'm still <laughs> sending recipes pushing the square box, you know, like, okay, this fruit, this fruit, this form, this shape. And then at some point they accepted one and they said, okay, this, this, this little like ball of apricot and reishi, which is a mushroom, uh, seems pretty okay uh, ingredient wise, but the spherical shape is not good because it's too attractive for kids. So <laughs> I was like, okay. So I just took my, I took my thumb, I, squ- I squashed the little ball, I took a picture, I sent it to the director. I said, is it good now? I said, oh, I said, oh it's a little bit too like uh, squished. Could you make a prism out of it? So I made a prism out of it, you know? And if you see Jubilee product all over the world, they're in prison because of this conversation with the SQDC. <laughs> Interesting. <you know? laughs> it's, it's fascinating to me, the little nuances that get applied to, to cannabis. Quebec must be, uh, at least from what I've heard, I haven't tried to purchase any cannabis there, but from conversations I've had, there's some challenges uh, within Quebec. As you already indicated, edibles relate to the market. I still don't have vapes, right? There's still no 510 vapes there. And there's a limit on THC in terms of the cannabis products. I found it interesting. I had a conversation just a couple of days ago with somebody, and, and the 30% THC limit for flour, I, I can totally understand that. But what I got confused by was I understand that they're now an, allowing infused pre rolls, but the maximum THC is 30%, <laughs> which in BC are, are infused are over 30%. <laughs> <laughs> What's your experience with that? Uh, it, it's actually like it's um, in Quebec. We, there, there's not a lot of like knowledge in the ruling parties that applied the law. So the not the cannabis knowledge itself is not there in the ruling party. The SQDC uh, board of directors, they're very knowledgeable people, but their their hands are tied. You know, they they, they, they would they, they could you know legalize pretty much every segment of the industry as in the rest of Canada. The SQDC has, has the knowledge to do so, but they have their they have their hand ties. You know, because of these ruling parties that push these very weird kind of um, conservative behaviors towards the uh, the um, towards the consumption it protects protects the consumer in, in a weird fashion I would say uh, the um, the 30 percent cap on flour which yeah it can make sense you know because you know metabolite wise it doesn't make much sense to push it further than that and um, and for, but for extract it doesn't make doesn't make any sense you know I'm a big rosin fan I'm a, I, I do my own rosin I do my own bubble ash and stuff and it doesn't make any sense that I cannot sell in Quebec the product that I consume doesn't make any sense that I cannot make like I've been doing like these these old school strains. I'm, I'm big yeah, big time old school strain guy, so I've got all these genetics that I keep, and I, I like to take to make like this old uh, lemonades or old Friesland ashish and stuff like that. I love to have like this very Quebec product that has been in Quebec for ages. You know, it's, we're not even even able to see see it in SQDC. As long as it's going to be like this, the the the, the um, the black market is going to be the strongest in Quebec. It is the strongest in, in, in the whole Canada in Quebec because of these regulations. You know, it pushes the consumer to go elsewhere, non-trackable stuff. You know, not 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 stable, uh, not not analyzed. You know, it's like I'm all about you know public safety, and that's not public safety. So that brings up another issue uh, in terms of dosages. Of course, the 10 milligram cap on on packaging for for THC uh, within Canada. That's I'm going to assume that that is the same implication in Quebec, still the same limit. It goes, it goes a bit further in Quebec. We can okay. put the 10, the 10 milligrams can be there in the edible, but it needs to be in two separate doses that are primarily packaged. You see? Oh, that's interesting. No, explain that a bit further. So I cannot have, like, let's say, in the Jubilee fruit bite, the, the offer that we have, we have two 20-gram fruit bites. 
that have five milligrams of THC in each and 10 milligrams of CBD in each. That's one of the variety that we have. We've got a lot of other profiles, that's one. So in Quebec, that's super legit. But if we wanted to put 10 milligrams of THC and 10 milligrams or 20 milligrams of CBD in one singular bite, that wouldn't be legal. In the, the, the THC needs to be separated into uh, 5.5 five or less, or like 2.5 2. or you know, 10, 10, 1, yeah. It's, it's this way. So it, it's, it pushed us again a bit more towards overpackaging. Yeah, yeah, but overpackaging is a huge issue in, in the cannabis industry. We we clearly have to do something about that. Are you doing anything at Jubilee to to kind of help that process along? Our our packaging are the, the you know we do, we use Mylar bags as as much as the industry as well, but we we source the Mylar bag in the in the uh, in a place that is sixty five percent more ecological than what the the, the state ask of us you know we cannot i would love to have like these fully compostable packaging as well you know where, where my, my board wouldn't like me if i go there too fast but at some <laughs> point we're all going to be able to compost everything that we have you know but we need to go there step by step but i'd say as well that we do our own extraction in-house we do uh, we do our co2 extraction in-house we use um uh, we, we use the supercritical, subcritical to do in there. We, the, the way we manage all these parts of the supply chain in a super small facility in a devitalized area, we're able to hire a lot of people in this devitalized area. We're able to, and the CO2 extraction technology is one of the most ecological compared to others technology. Let's say that we, we reuse 97% of the solvent that we use. Solvent is CO2. So it allows us to be very agile with it. And we don't, we don't uh, distill it. We don't purify. We don't filter. We use full spectrum crude oil that we make in house that I make with my, with, with, with the, the, the um, scientific director over there as well. Uh, we do our own full spectrum crude that we're very proud of. That's very rich in flavonoids and in, in terpenes, 3% terpenes, believe it or not, 3.5% terpene in the full spectrum crude. And we put it in edibles. You know, there's no edibles that puts it in there. Ash edibles, Rosin Head and, and Todd that I respect very much does that, you know, with this full spectrum extract that is rosin, but our full spectrum crude is, is very much, you know, with all the compounds of the plant, but the plant itself, you know. Wow. That just sounds fascinating to me. For me, as a person, the, the distillate doesn't do anything for me in the edible. So I'm really pleased to hear that you're working with the full spectrum. That makes a whole lot more sense. Always, always. It never, never was in my, my mind to work with anything else than hash and full spectrum crude, anything else than that. Then we can tweak it. You know, you can tweak it with, you can use distillate in, in your base of full spectrum, but I don't want to see anything else than full spectrum as a base. The base needs to be the full spectrum. Then you tweak it. Then you put a bit of CBG. Then you put a bit of, uh, of like another full spectrum of CBN. Then you, you arrive to your, 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 your right dosages and then you dilute it, you know, but the base of it needs to be a full spectrum crude. Anything else is the, is the easy way out. It's too easy. It's, it's the easy way of putting it's the, the distillate is the, Easy way and the cheap way to put the product forward. It's a result of prohibition again. There's place for this. There's place for this. I'm not saying that uh, I'm eating, you know, chocolate myself. I love chocolate, especially again these of Todd's. But you know, like it's uh, it, it, it's a result of prohibition. This product. We need to push forward. We need to push further than this. And that's what we've been doing with this. And I think using the full spectrum crude oil is the way to respect the plant itself and to give the consumer the full potency of what the plant has to offer, you know, like, and we've been testing it, you know, a 10 milligram distillate versus a 10 milligram uh, full spectrum crude. Some, some people say, oh, yours is like 15. I say, no, no, it's just 10, but it's, it's the real deal. There's like, and, and we have got the COA and we're going to use the COA in our socials very, like in, in early 2024 to show people, you see, that's what's in there. There's like THCP, CBC, CBD, flavonoids, terpene, 3.5% of terpenes, you know. That's, that's pretty cool. Well done. We have people listening, Alexandra, that can make a difference, that can that can uh, affect some change. What would you say to those people of things we need to be doing to the Canadian cannabis industry to make us better in 2024? Uh, definitely, we need to address the excise. The excise, uh, the excise laws are, are, are pushing our industry uh, down. You know, they're they're making it's making uh, it very difficult to thrive in this industry, regardless of the talent, regardless of the of uh, the equity of the um, of the business plan or anything. It pushes us down as an industry. I'd say the milligramage as well of cannabinoids. If we want to push, uh, if we want to push the, the 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 black market aside, if we want to thrive, if we want to give good products, safe product to the Canadian consumer, we need to push the milligramage above. I don't say I'd say 100 would be amazing, but maybe we'd start lower than this. Maybe we'd start with 20. Maybe we'd start with 50. You know, but we need to push it further. Maybe we put some rules that we need to be packaged. You know, like in Quebec, I could live with this, but we need. We need Mark Mowers to push this forward. It needs to go there because people, most edible people don't eat edibles with so, so low cannabinoids in them. And, and, and what's costing, you know, it, you know, like in, in my edible, in my cost of my edible, the cannabinoids are 11 cents. It's the food that costs a lot. 
in the food, my, my, my food, which is a pristine supply chain, costs a lot. If I could put more cannabinoid, my product won't be much, much more expensive. Not, not at all. It would be a little, little couple cent, but it would still be super accessible, you know, and we need this, you know, we need for people to consume, for people that are in the black market to consume safe cannabis, we need to push it above. I'd say these two things, these two things would be a good beginning. There's a lot, a lot of other things, you know, but the, these two things, and then I'd say the marketing, you know, like the marketing and education. And when we cannot market properly a product, a CPG, anything, when we cannot market properly, we cannot educate properly. And at the end of the day, it's the consumer that doesn't get what he deserves. Education, knowledge on the product. And if the consumer was educated, he wouldn't buy 32% THC all day long. He wouldn't just think about about his wallet and, and the, two per, the, the percentage of THC. He would say, oh, flavonoids, that might be a cool thing to know about. That might, it gets you higher, 50, uh, 550 uh, more t- times more affinity with CB1 receptor in the, T, uh, the canaflavin A. It's, it's amazing. It's super psychoactive, this, and we don't know about it because we're not allowed to tell anybody about it, you know. Those are some fantastic ideas. I love your passion. It just it rings through your voice every word you say, Alexander. And it's nice to share passion with this plant with you because I have been as passionate about it for the last 50 years as well. You've taught me a lot. You've given me a pretty good idea about what you're doing at Jubilee. Do you have anything uh, currently in the works that uh, you're looking to uh, bring out 2024? Yes, so we're actually, we're going on the savory side in 2024. We're pushing uh, other brands. We're working with sauce. We're coming with spicy sauce and hot honey. And uh, again, we're, we're working with like a very local perspective. A, a neighbor of ours, is, uh, he makes honey, you know, from his farm. Uh, he sells it in bulk. And uh, we went to see him. He said like, hey, maybe you can make more money if you don't sell it in bulk and you sell it for, uh, to us, you know, when we put cannabis in it. And then he said, yes, what's, what's the, and, he, and we, we've got this partnership. The, the, the bees literally come in our plants in the facility, you know, their bees. And we will use this super local honey that we infuse with our full spectrum crude oil and nice, nice cayenne pepper, local cayenne pepper as well. And we'll have this hot honey to put on fried chicken, pizzas, and such, which is a different approach from the from the Jubilee uh, very health oriented edibles. But honey is very health oriented. Just depends sure. on what you put it on, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that sounds delicious. I can't can't wait to taste those. Excellent. Well, thanks for your time today, Alexander. If you don't mind, let me finish with my hot seat questions. Just a few series of questions that I think you've got some easy answers to. Do you have a favorite cultivar? Oh, I love the DJ Source Blueberry. DJ okay. Source Blueberry is my go-to. My go-to. Very smooth. Uh, 16% is the, the one that I made this year. Okay, nice. Excellent. Uh, joints or vape? Oh, joints. Well, uh, and I guess because you can't do vapes, you go back. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I feel my own vapes. My girlfriend's all about vape, and then we, we fill it with, with our own rosin that we make in-house. Okay, good. Uh, do you have a favorite munchie? Oh, chocolate. All the way chocolate. Chocolate is my go-to munchie. Um, I, I need to control myself. Even talking about it, it makes me hungry, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Edibles or flower? Oh, it's <laughs> hard to say. I'd, say. I'd say edibles, but if you would say edibles or rosin, I might have said rosin. Oh, okay. Okay. I may have to alter my question. <laughs> <It's been laughs> I'm talking to them. Well, fantastic. I love the conversation. You've, you've taught me a whole bunch about what you're doing at Jubilee and with the Quebec Council of Edibles. Thanks so much for your time, Alexander. Do you have any final words? No, I just want to say I appreciate the, your work. I appreciate your work you've been doing for so, so long. I love your your terpene background as well. Fantastic work, man. It's, it's amazing. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you uh, for giving us a voice. I think it's a big part of what needs to be done. And let's, let's collaborate and let's go forward. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being with me and you enjoy the rest of your night. Cheers. THC, CBD, terpene profiles, what's in me? Oh, please explain to me. Go to the corner. Go to the corner. Oh, yeah. Go to the corner. Please explain this stuff to me. One of the fun things about being involved in the cannabis industry in Canada since October 17, 2018, is to see how the industry is constantly changing and evolving. And various companies have certain things they're doing, and they move on to other things as time goes by. There's been a number of growers that we have talked about over the course of doing Cultivar Corner, and we often refer to them picking up some bud that was grown by J-Buds. J-Buds is down in Summerland. Pistol and Paris being one of them. They've grown for Ghost Drops. They've grown for Chocolate Park. And it's really nice to see that J-Buds now has their own brand. J-Buds Craft Cannabis. This is out of Summerland. We'll give you the story on the family. It is a family operation that grows the J-Buds. And we're going to do their dream catcher, which is 3.5 grams of a sativa. And it is a family affair at J-Buds. Get to know the family-run team committed to delivering exceptional services with a personal touch. Passionate about their work and dedicated to client satisfaction. Bob Johnson is the proprietor. 
A former professional engineer, Bob now spends his time managing J-Buds with his family. Lisa Johnson is on top of numbers and reporting at J-Buds. Dylan Johnson studies geoscience at the University of British Columbia and manages sales and assists his brother in growing premium BC cannabis. And that brother is Noah Johnson, the master grower. Noah is dedicated to growing the finest craft cannabis, and Noah enjoys playing sports and has a passion for music as well. And the CFO and investor is Josh. They have Johnson in brackets. I think he's an adopted brother at J-Buds. His 10 years experience in finance and business is utilized within the J-Buds family. And some of the weed they have been growing has already made a name for itself. And this is a top-to-bottom cultivar corner. Let's open the package. This is the J-Buds Dream Catcher. Just had this delivered by Kilo Cannabis. I was feeling lazy, didn't feel like going out and, and doing some shopping. Always nice when I can order it and have it delivered in a fairly short period of time. Thank you for that, Kilo. And this is the J-Bods. Oh, my goodness sakes. Mmm. So, first of all, let's give you the details. This is Dreamcatcher. 28.8% uh, THC. Total terp sitting at 3.6. Mmm. Very aromatic on that bud. Let me give you a description if I can find it on Dreamcatcher. Grown by J-Bods Craft Cannabis. This is a Zativa. Dreamcatcher. It's a cross of Holy Grail and Blue Dream, THC range from 27 to 32, Terps from 3 to 4, and my bag, THC at 28.8, and the Terps at 3.6. Mm -mm -mm. Delicious. So that's a nice cross, Holy Grail and Blue Dream. And we are going to get into the Holy Grail and Blue Dream. So pull the buds out. Let's take a look at what we got in terms of my three and a half. I got a total of five buds, so really nicely sized. The Cure, very nice. Dark green in color. Lots of dark red pistols as well. And very firm. We got some stickiness to it. Yeah, there's some stickiness there as well. Of course, the smaller the bud gets, the more illustrative the sticky is going to be. <laughs> and especially when we start breaking up those buds. And then the parts we have broken up are really, really sticky. So really nicely trimmed. Let's take a look and see if I've got any errant sugar leaves. Yeah, there's one there, but that's not too bad to, to call them on. It's always going to be a little challenging. Really nice looking weed. Seems to have the right amount of moisture. I'm getting a lot of um, squeezed bud. It uh, pulls back a little bit, expands a little bit. So let me get myself a joint rolled. And let me get something ready for my Ariser Air Max. Now, the aroma... Oh, even more so once I bust up those buds and throw it into my grinder. So it has been an interesting year in cannabis, 2023. Uh, lots of things have happened here at the Cannabis Podcast. We've expanded a little bit and, of course, continuing to do a cultivar a week or a cultivar an episode. So that means we've probably done 26 cultivars in the last year. And you can go back to all the previous episodes and take a peek at what some of those cultivars were. I'm going to put my weed back in my bag so it doesn't go too far on me. I got my joint rolled. I am still enjoying the Air Max from a riser. as a nice portable vaporizer. Good strong battery. It has not yet died on me in a session. So lots of power there and lots of, lots of time to take that power on. So this is J-Bud's Dream Catcher. They grow out of Summerland. They've been growing some very fine bud. This is one of the first that I have tested under their own brand, and this is Dreamcatcher. I'm looking for a nice sativa today, this being my last Saturday of, well, I guess there's still one more Saturday, but my last Saturday before we get into all this Christmas activities. And I do want to get out and, and do a few things. I've done all my Christmas shopping, so I don't have to do any of that. Oh, well, that's nice and smooth. And now the Air Max is getting close to temperature. So I don't have much description in terms of what my tastes are going to be in this. We met the team. We've talked about the facility a little bit. And I, of course, will have the posting, uh, the link on the show page for the Cannabis Podcast. So you can check out all these details yourself. J Buzz Craft Cannabis is a licensed micro cultivation and processing facility located in Summerland, B.C., J Buds is a proud indigenous owned company deeply rooted in the community. They're passionate about excellence, committed to their values, giving back to the community, and supporting indigenous causes. And may I also add, 
and growing some pretty fine weed. And now let's see what Dreamcatcher tastes like when we put it through the Air Max. Okay. Mmm, some nice fruity notes in there. Probably some of those citrus notes coming from Blue Dream. And do I have some terpenes on this? Yes, I do. <laughs> and there's that terpene I've just been loving of late. It's funny how our bodies kind of find a terpene that we really like and seems the weed that I've been most smoking lately. There's been a lot of farnesine. So the terpenes in Dreamcatcher, uh, beta myrcene, limonene, and pharmacine, pharnesine. And total terps is 3.6%. Don't have the percentages of the actual terpenes. And I find farnesine for me gives some of those nice candy tones and candy notes. Which I'm thinking is going to be coming from the Blue Dream in this. And perhaps a little of that limonene uh, coming from the Holy Grail. Let's not forget we still got the joint going. And let's not forget, we're still trying to figure out what the impact is on my endocannabinoid system. As I say, I'm looking for a really nice sativa today. I, I got to get some stuff done, and I just kind of want to chill in the fact that I'm doing that stuff, and I would really like to be high while I'm doing it, which is not an unusual situation for Gary at the Cannabis Podcast. <laughs> THC 28.8, another hit off of the vaporizer. Mmm, really love the taste of that. And for me, I think it's the pharnesine that's giving me those really nice tasty notes. A little bit of a citrus from the limonene and some of the earthy tones coming from that beta myrcene. Really attractive flower. Uh, really nicely structured in terms of the buds. Really sticky once you start to break those buds up. And <laughs> here's the thing that matters. What's the effect? The effect so far is pretty darn good. <laughs> Definitely got a buzz going. What's my intention today? We've talked about it a lot, and I, I and I often don't set up a cultivar corner with my intention for the day, because I think my intention is obvious just to see whether it gives me a buzz or not. I do have a bit more intention today. I do want to get a few things done around the house. I need to get a few things settled as we finish off the year. And a few other things that I have to get taken care of today. So I, I want a little bit of energy. I want a little bit of focus. But as always, I want the further enhancement of that focus. So that is my intention today. To get some things done. Get enough of a buzz that I'm going to enjoy the experience. And, and enjoy it more as I go through that. And so far, so good on the effects. Oh yeah, there's the happy eyes. Another hit out of the vaporizer. So picking up some of those candy tones from the pharnesine, I believe. A little citrus from that limonene. Mm -hmm -hmm. And the happy eyes coming on a little bit stronger. So I don't know whether you have access to the flower. I'm hoping you do. Uh, if you do, it's definitely worth a try have liked a lot of the, the flour that they have produced for other people over the last three or four years. Oh yeah, pulling that bed out again for another like, look at that. Nice dark tones. Mm, really finely cured, really finely. What's this, the word I'm looking for? <laughs> uh, trimmed. <laughs> okay. I may have validated that I'm high. <laughs> that was one of those moments where you go looking for that word and the word just runs into another room and you've got to go and try to find it. <laughs> yeah, definitely a nice bud, nice buzz. I'm pleased that they're out with their own product now. They've been growing a lot of fine bud for a lot of other people. And now they put their own name on it and putting it right out in front. <sighs> I'm going to go catch some dreams. <laughs> I know I got some dreams out there, and I know they are worth catching. And we're going to see if we can catch a few of those ourselves today. Dream catcher, a sativa dominant from J Buds in Summerland, growing craft cannabis and making my weekend a whole lot more enjoyable. Maybe it'll do the same for you. Sharing stories about good weed while trying good weed. 
This is the Cannabis Podcast. And let me once again thank you for being here. I truly appreciate that you are a listener of the podcast. And we're going to end with some humor today, but it's not going to be one of the canned jokes. <laughs> this is literally some humor that happened in my house over the, over the Christmas holidays. And I think it's a fine example of a true cannabis moment. I don't know about you, but I like a good grilled cheese sandwich. And I'm always interested in, in different ways and different people who are finding ways to make a better grilled cheese sandwich. Well, I came across this link on YouTube and was following it and had some good ideas. I mean, it's a basic, it's a pretty simple sandwich, right? <laughs> it shouldn't be all that difficult. But following the, the guidelines of this particular person I was watching on YouTube, and it came to time to make it. And my wife and I were doing things. She was having something else. I was making, no, I was, I was actually making the grilled cheese sandwiches. <laughs> and I perhaps shouldn't have smoked that joint before I started. <laughs> and here's why. Got the bread all prepped. Got my multiple cheeses ready to be used. Uh, assemble the sandwich on the grill, putting it layer by layer, my bottom piece down. Then I put my cheese on top of that and, and for more cheese on top of that. So they get a beautiful mixture of melting, gooey, stringy cheese. Put my top piece of bread on there and turn the heat on and, and we watch it. Now, the, the trick with this method was to do it at a slower temperature. In the past, I'd, I'd kind of used higher temperatures to kind of flash burn that, that, that bread. At the lower temperature, your bread gets crispy, uh, but the cheese has a chance to evenly melt across that sandwich. At least that's what I was hoping for. <laughs> so, assembled the sandwich, turned on the heat, and I'm watching it cook. And I'm checking the bottom to see, you know, make sure it doesn't get too dark and too brown. And, oh, it's just, just a beautiful golden brown as I turn it over. And yet it seems some of my cheese is still not melted. I had a couple of different varieties. I had a cheese slice and I had a little Gruyere grated on top of that cheese slice. And, and the Gruyere seemed to be melting, but the, for whatever reason, the cheese slice just didn't seem to be doing anything. Flipped it over, still waiting and hoping that this sandwich is going to materialize and it's going to be just delicious when it's finished. <laughs> and finally, through one of my flips, as I flipped it back over, I took a good look at the cheese and I realized what the problem was. Remember I mentioned that slice of cheese? And you know how those slices of cheese are, are wrapped in that little bit of plastic, which you're supposed to open up and then put the cheese in the sandwich? <laughs> so my cannabis moment was leaving the cheese inside the plastic wrap in my sandwich. And hence, why one of my cheeses never melted a bit. <laughs> and the rule, or I guess the moral of that story, smoke the joint after you've made the sandwich. If you have ever had a comment, please send a note to info at CannabisPodcast.com. If you would like to be a supporter, you can go to buymeacoffee.com slash podcast. If you like what you hear and you feel so inclined, you can buy me a doobie. Or you can become a patron at Patreon. And you'll find the links to all of those on the top right when you're on the show page. Thanks so much for being here. That's it for episode 140 of the Cannabis Podcast. From the Cannabis Infused Studio, high above the Okanagan Valley, this was the Cannabis Podcast. Thanks for listening to today's show. To check out more great cannabis podcasts, go to podconnects.com. Here's a preview of one of our other shows. Hey friends, I'm Brandon. And I'm Saba. And we are your host of the Cannabis Hangout Podcast, an educational platform to connect with the cannabis community and share personal stories while breaking the stigma of marijuana. Join us every Sunday at 7 p.m. to gain valuable insight with different perspectives from industry leaders, growers, and medical marijuana patients. This is a place to learn so much from different angles in the cannabis industry. So tune in while, while we, we break, break it all down. down.